Uh, today's subject is lies hypnotists tell. And uh, I, think, I think we all tell a few of these. So uh, we're going to be talking about lies that, that hypnotists tell to their clients and lies that hypnotists tell to other hypnotists. That, that would never happen, would it? And, and lies that, uh, that maybe that we tell to ourselves. So let's get started. Let's, let's start off with, a, with an easy one. And, and this is the lie where we say to a client, um, everybody can be hypnotized. Everybody. Now, this is not strictly true. Uh, studies have shown that a certain, a certain element of the population, and the figure I hear most is 10%. 10% of people just can't be hypnotized for whatever reason. Uh, it could be trust issues, could be inability to concentrate, could be they just have no desire to get hypnotized. And, uh, and so it's not true when we say everybody can be hypnotized. But so why, why do we say that? Well, the reason is that we want to, um, we want the client or the subject to have confidence in his or her ability to go into trance. Because if they are not confident in the, in the process, if they don't believe that the process works, then there's a much smaller chance that they are going to go into trance. Now, I did a study years ago of my clients that came in to me, see me for hypnotherapy, and only about 5% of my clients had ever been hypnotized before. Uh, your, your numbers may be similar. So they did not know what to expect. And so I wanted to encourage them and to give them the impression that uh, that they could achieve this. They could achieve trance, they could achieve hypnosis. And I think that made them more highly hypnotizable uh, when they hear from the hypnotist, from the expert, that everyone is hypnotizable. So it's a little white lie, but the only reason why we, I think it's an honorable lie, because the only reason why we say it is we want to help them uh, enter trance so that we can do our therapy and we can help them. So I don't feel bad about telling that lie, but it is a lie. Not everyone can be hypnotized. Um, okay, so here, here's another one. Um, everyone can go into deep trance or somnambulism. Now, the the definition of somnambulism varies from person to person. And um, for instance, uh, Hippolyte Bernheim uh, considered somnambulism to be the state where clients would uh, come out of hypnosis and they would have spontaneous amnesia for the session that they would just taken part in, All right? But uh, Dave Ellman's in, uh, definition uh, when we talk about the Dave Elman induction, it gets to the point at the end of the induction when we uh, attempt to get the client to demonstrate amnesia, or some people call it losing the numbers. And when they lose the numbers, they have demonstrated amnesia, which for Elman's purposes was uh, somnambulism. So it's a different different definition. But in truth, only a small percentage of the population can achieve deep, deep trance or somnambulism according to um, Bernheim's definition. Now, some people will look at this and they'll say, well, 20%, if only 20% can achieve this, then what, you know, that's not good. I mean, how can hypnotherapy be everybody's therapy if only one person out of five can get into deep trance. And the answer to this is that you don't need deep trance in order to make good therapeutic change. Uh, the majority of my clients have been for weight loss, mostly because I used to market at ladies' gyms. But 
I found that many of my clients uh, who could achieve very deep trance were not my best successes as far as weight loss went. However, I had many clients who achieved what I determined, what I estimated to be a very light level of hypnosis, but they were doing wonderfully and losing lots of weight. So in my experience working with thousands of clients, and you might have seen uh, my dog in the background, uh, working with thousands of clients is that um, the depth of trance really does, there's no correlation between depth of trance and the ability to make a change. So if you say that everyone can achieve deep, deep trance or somnambulism, it, it's not really true. It, it isn't true, but it doesn't really matter. There are only a couple of times when depth of trance really, really comes into play. And one of those is when you're working with pain because a light trance will enable you to get the client uh, analgesia. In other words, you can lessen their pain. But if you get a deep trance, you can actually achieve or your client can actually achieve um, uh, anesthesia, which is they feel absolutely nothing, which is beautiful when you're working with pain. So. Pain is one uh, area where you want deep trance. And the other area is if you're doing a stage show or if you're doing street hypnosis, because the deeper the trance, the more entertaining uh, suggestions you can get your subjects to adopt. You can't, you can't get them to, uh, to demonstrate uh, a negative hallucination, as in the hypnotist disappears, you can't do that with a light level of trance. You need a deep level of trance. And as I said in the beginning, only about one person in five or 20% of subjects can achieve deep trance or Bernheim's definition of somnambulism. Okay. So let's let's go uh, let's go to a lie that that I was taught when I first started learning hypnosis, and I was taught that some people are groups of people uh, do better at hypnosis than others, and one of them was military people. I was taught that military people tend to be really good hypnotic subjects. Now I was in the military. And um, I, um, I'm not that great a subject. And one of the reasons why they said military people, why they say military people are, are good hypnotic subjects is because they say military people know how to follow orders. And that's true. I mean, I, I followed orders. I wasn't particularly happy about it all the time, but I followed orders. Uh, but I'm, I'm not a good hypnotic subject. So I, I, I wondered, you know, where did this come from? Where did this idea come from that military people make great hypnotic subjects? And, and I found something. Uh, many of you may know about a book called Trilby. It's um, people, it, it's when people think about the book Trilby, they think about Svengali or the evil hypnotists. And Trilby is a, um, is, is a book about an evil hypnotist that uh, controls this young, beautiful young woman. And this evil hypnotist was named in the book Svengali. Now, Svengali, or the story of Svengali, or the Trilby, was actually based on a true uh, case. This was during um, the late 1800s. And, and um, there was a, a, a baroness, and I believe she was a German baroness, but I'm not sure, it might have been somewhere in the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Anyway, this baroness, um, she was seduced by this evil hypnotist, um, a guy named uh, uh, Zinsky. And Zinsky was this, uh, this, little guy from Poland and and he 
he wasn't particularly attractive or tall or didn't seem to have anything really going for him. But he seduced this baroness and um, they, they hooked up and uh, she, would juice, she would do his bidding and nobody could understand what was going on there because why would she be controlled by this, this guy, this evil hypnotist? Well, anyway, um, there was, uh, I guess they decided a crime had been committed. And uh, so they, they put Zinsky on trial for taking advantage of this baroness. And believe me, there is a point to this. <laughs> so Zinsky's on trial, and one of the expert witnesses is this psychiatrist named Professor Ludwig Hurt. Professor Ludwig Hurt, and the, the trial was uh, took place in 1894. And this psychiatrist, Pro Professor Ludwig Hurt, was an expert in hypnosis. He was called as the hypnosis expert in the trial. And one statement in his long testimony, uh, as he began to talk about what makes people highly hypnotizable or what, what groups are highly hypnotizable, he talked about, well, women, they're more highly hypnotizable. He's, he's right about that. But also he said, military people are highly hypnotizable. It's just an offhand comment that Professor Ludwig Hurt made during Zinsky's trial in 1894, and, and, and it stuck. And hypnotists and hypnosis instructors have been repeating this lie or this untruth for years and years and years and years. And that's where I believe this came from, the idea that military people are highly hypnotizable. Uh, in truth, some uh, military people are highly hypnotizable and some are not. It's, it's just a normal distribution. There's nothing special about military people. So there you go. There's your trivia for today. All right, so um, let's, let's talk about other lies that we tell to clients. Um, here's one. You do a suggestibility test with a client and you say, um, may, say it's finger magnets, right? And you tell them there are magnets in their fingertips and as they stare at their fingertips, they get closer and closer and closer together and then they touch. And then you say to the client, wow, you did really, really well. Well, well, did she? Well, people who do this test know that when the hands are clasped together tightly like this and you pull those fingertips apart, um, it's just a physiological thing that those fingertips are gonna wanna touch because if you stop holding them, them apart, they touch, right? So, but, so why do we do this? Why do we lie to the client and go, wow, you did really well. I'll bet you, you're gonna do very well in hypnosis. Well, once again, it's to encourage them and set their expectation that they are going to do well in hypnosis because if they're not afraid and they believe they're going to do well in hypnosis, there's a far better chance that they will go into trance. So we're only saying this lie just for their benefit so that they are confident that they can do this. So that's a, that's a lie that we tell. You did great. Oh, here's a good one. Here's a really good one. Um, it is uh, intelligence. Have you ever said to a client or a subject, the more intelligent you are, the better you will at going into hypnosis. As a matter of fact, the more intelligent people are far more hypnotizable than others that are not as intelligent. Is that true? You may, you may believe that yourself. It's not true. <laughs> the science does not, uh, does not confirm this. Uh, as a matter of fact, there were two studies that I know of, one done by Hilgard in 1965 and the other done by Kroger in 77. And they gave intelligence tests to their subjects and then they tested for hypnotizability. And the intelligent ones, the intelligence had nothing to do with people's ability to go into hypnosis, had nothing to do with their ability to go into deep hypnosis. 
Um, so whether you're extremely smart or whether you're really dumb, I mean, as long as you can concentrate, uh, you may be hypnotizable. So, so that's not true. When we say the more intelligent you are, the better you are at going in hypnosis, it's just not true. Um, do, do I say it? Yes, I do. Yes, I do. <laughs> It, it, there, it's, it's sort of implied when you tell them that uh, if you cooperate with me and you follow my instructions, um, you will go into hypnosis. We know that. It, you're a better chance if you cooperate. And uh, so many people will cooperate because they don't want to be seen as not being intelligent. So, yeah. Some people will say, yeah, anyone can be hypnotized. Anyone of normal intelligence. Yeah, it's not really nice, but I, I've done it. I know people that have done it. Not me, of course. Okay, um, here's one. Uh, don't, you probably learned this in your training. Don't hypnotize drunks. Don't hypnotize drunks. That's, that's bad news, right? Well, I would say that that's not exactly true. In fact, um, people who are slightly tipsy are more highly hypnotizable than people who are stone cold sober. So, um, so instructors will tell uh, people in hypnosis classes that it's a bad idea to hypnotize drunks. And actually it's not. Um, now, if somebody is very, very drunk, um, it's, it's uh, you know, they'll go into hypnosis, but they're not going to have the concentration that you're probably going to want from them. But uh, could somebody who's tipsy, uh, can you hypnotize them? Certainly you can. And uh, as a matter of fact, they will be more highly hypnotizable than someone who's sober. And there's some science behind this. The uh, University of Leeds did an experiment in 2013 and they gave students several pints of lager and then tested their hypnotizability, their level of hypnosis compared to students who were just um, drinking water sober. And they found that the ones who had consumed the lager were far more hypnotizable than the people who were sober. So, and I, I've, I've duplicated, duplicated this experiment myself in Heidelberg back in, I think, 2016. And that was my finding too, that, uh, you know how they say a lot, of, a lot of scientific experiments can't be duplicated? Well, this one, I duplicated it. And yes, my people who were drinking were far more hypnotizable than my people who were not drinking. So there you go. So that's, that's not true. Okay, uh, here, here's, here's one that we say often when we're trying to explain hypnosis to people. We'll say, you know, it's, have you ever been driving your car and, uh, and you get home and you realize that I wasn't paying attention. I don't remember anything about the drive. And we'll say, see, it's, it, hypnosis is like that. It's, it's well, it, it's not really like that. See, in my mind, hypnosis is a, uh, is a, uh, a state of mind where you become more highly suggestible. And highly, highway hypnosis, in my mind, is nothing like that. Um, I, how many times have you been driving the car and maybe your spouse says, your turn is coming up, your turn is coming up, hey, your turn is coming up. Well, if, if you were in hypnosis, that should sink in and you should make that turn. But you don't, you go straight through and you miss your turn, you miss your exit. So, no, I, I, I think there's, there's absolutely nothing, uh, highway hypnosis has, has absolutely nothing to do with hypnosis. It's, um... But telling people it's similar sort of demystifies and, and makes hypnosis seem far less intimi intimidating. So that's why we say this. Um, oh, and sometimes uh, I've heard hypnotists say, well, you go in and out of hypnosis several times every day, or sometimes they'll say hundreds of times every day. Well, is that true? I, I don't think so. I don't, I don't think I go into hypnosis many, many times during a day. There's some times I let my mind wander, but that's not hypnosis. 
it's it's might be kind of a similar feeling but it's not hypnosis but once again we say this to kind of demystifies and and uh demystifies hypnosis and make it seem very uh benign okay now let me let me do a couple more of these these fibs and then um and then uh that'll be it for today's lesson okay Age regression is the best way to deal with every uh, issue. Age regression, the, the idea behind age regression is that if you have a problem, it's probably due to something that happened in your past, maybe when you were a child. Um, often this is true. It is. I mean, you may have a phobia or, or another problem because of something that happened in your childhood. It's quite possible, but it's not always the case. Not everything, every issue that you have uh, has a root cause that can be found and neutralized in an age regression. Um, take smoking for instance. Um, people do not necessarily smoke because of some hidden childhood trauma. It's, it's just, it's probably not there. It's just a habit or they, um, when they were a, a young teen or a, a young adolescent, they um, uh, they caved into peer pressure and started to smoke. At any rate, uh, many things don't require an age regression to get at it. Um, here, here's another one about age regression is that um, memories obtained in an age regression are usually uh, accurate. And they're really not. I mean, all the research in, into memory suggests that um, every time you remember something, you remake it in your mind. And, and so an age regression or a, um, an, uh, a situation that's recalled in an age regression is not necessarily going to be accurate. As a matter of fact, it might be completely untrue, speaking of lies. It might be what we call a confabulation, where your mind can come up with something um, Gilboyne used to say, let's see, what was the quote? In hypnosis, there is a, um, an emotionalized desire to please the operator. And so when you hypnotize somebody and do an age regression on them, it's quite possible that just to please you, they will come up with some issue, whether it happened or not, in order to please the hypnotist. So... So hypnotically uh, obtained um, uh, memories are not necessarily true. And that's why uh, most courts don't accept hypnotically um, uh, induced uh, testimony, you know, because memories are, your memory is, is very fragile <laughs> and, and especially in hypnosis. So, um, so yeah, so hypnotically obtained uh, memories, not necessarily true. Could be true, maybe not. Um, okay, let's, let's do another one. Um, oh, let's, let's do one that, uh, that hypnotists tell themselves. And it's the one where you say to yourself, you know, if I just get this one more class, I will be ready to start my practice. And the truth of the matter is you can chase classes forever and never ever open your practice, which is kind of a shame because it's a waste of all the training that you've had so far. So I'd say if you've had good training, get out there and start seeing clients and you're gonna learn more from your clients than you will learn in any class. That's true. Um, get out there and start helping people. Don't become a seminar junkie. Get out there, take a good hypnosis course, and then go out there and help people, and you're gonna learn a lot more just in interacting with your clients. Um, okay, here, here, a couple more lies, and then, and then we'll close it for today. Um, you know, my, um, my treatment for weight loss, smoking, phobias, whatever, is 100% successful. 
Do you believe that? You shouldn't. Nothing is 100% successful. Uh, if a hypnotist tells you that, that their program is 100% successful, they might be telling a little, a little white lie, okay? Because, you know, hypnosis is wonderful. It is so effective and, and you can do so much good, but you can't help everyone. No one can help everyone. Your doctor can't help everyone. Um, and I have a lot of respect for physicians, but nothing in the world is 100% effective, 100% uh, successful. So, so don't say that. Don't tell your client. You can tell them this is very successful. I've helped you know many people. Um, you can even say you can say a number. Just make it a real number. Don't say, oh, here's a lie. Well, I've hypnotized seven million people. <laughs> well, really? I, I no. Don't don't tell that one either. That one's out there, but don't don't tell that one either because nobody's going to believe it. I hope I hope nobody's going to believe it. So. Um, and I'll give you one more lie, and uh, and then we'll we'll finish for the day. And this one is that I have hypnotized everyone I've ever attempted to hypnotize. I have never failed to hypnotize a person. Do you believe that? Well, <laughs> at one time I said that, and then I hypnotized my ninth person and it didn't work if someone says that they've never failed to hypnotize somebody i say you haven't hypnotized enough people because you will fail you have to fail not everybody is hypnotizable so so uh, be very um uh, be very leery of a hypnotist that tells you that they have never failed to hypnotize somebody because it's going to happen after you after you hypnotize a few people you will fail and that's fine it's not a big deal um but that's a that's kind of a whopper of a lie of course it's not bad as calling yourself the world's fastest hypnotist now that's really bad so anyway that's it that's it for today and uh, if you have any questions just email me uh you know where to find me all right take care bye-bye